The day that my childhood tranquility was shattered is forever etched in my mind. I will never forget it. I was in junior high school, sitting in my Monday morning, one of my Monday morning classes. All of a sudden the door opened, the school secretary appeared, called my name. Remember I started to get up and walk to the door and she said, bring your books. She said that I had a bit of an idea that something big was happening. So I walked with the secretary out down a short hallway. I remember rounding the corner to the main hallway down by the school office. The moment I made eye contact with my mother, she broke down in tears. And in that moment I knew that whatever it was that was awaiting me was not going to be good news. Something that would probably change my world forever, and it did. Previous day, my grandmother had been involved in an automobile accident. She'd had some surgery. The overall prognosis seemed to be good. But what we didn't know until much later, the impact of the collision that she had hit the dashboard pretty hard. And when she did so, it ruptured her, her aorta. And a very large blood clot had formed. Went ahead with some of the other surgeries. But that night, suddenly that blood clot moved, killing her instantly. So she died very unexpectedly at the age of 63, which in kind of an eerie way, I realize that's the age that I am now. But she died unexpectedly, and life in our family would never be the same again. The abrupt pain of death stabbed me in the heart. But the next few days were a blur of activity, a range of emotions, people that were coming and going, our family eating meals together, and ultimately, of course, a funeral and a gravesite service. On a cold, rainy February day, we gathered to hear my grandmother's life memorialized. And as a young teenager, I listened intently for some words of comfort and hope that would make some sense of what had transpired during those few days. And looking back, I can say that on that day in my early teen years, hope began to spring to life amidst what I saw as hopelessness of a terrible tragedy. And again, looking back, I can say that from that time forward, words about resurrection, words about a coming age of perfection in the kingdom of God began to find fertile soil in my life. Out of the pain of that time, hope began to develop in my life. There is a thought, there is even an image that I'd like to make our focus this morning. And it is this, if we can have our next screen. That hope is shaped on the anvil of God. I'd like that thought and that image to stay focused in our minds for the next few moments. Like a blacksmith shaping red hot metal, I believe that God also shapes hope in our lives through the red hot trials that we endure in life. It is something I believe to be true. It is something that we find borne out in the words of Romans chapter 5, looking in the first five verses this morning. So the translation I'm referring to, the Holman translation, it words it this way. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that our affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character and proven character produces 
hope. And this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. Some tremendous thoughts in those five verses. We are told that God's wrath is replaced with peace through faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Whereas there had been wrath, whereas there had been warfare openly between us and God, because of believing in faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, peace takes place within. Peace being the opposite of unrest and turmoil. So we can literally say that we experience personal peace in our lives. But it is more than just personal peace. It is a peaceful coexistence between ourselves and God our Father. God thinks of us in a peaceful, loving way because of that step of faith, believing in what Christ has done for us. When I think about a peaceful coexistence with God, I think of a prayer that a friend of mine years ago prayed on a regular basis that meant so much. I still think of it often today. He would say, God, I thank you that your thoughts toward us are thoughts of peace and of love. And so often he would preface his prayers with that phrase, and I believe that to be the case. In faith and accepting what Christ has done for us, we can pray to our Father and say, God, I thank you that your thoughts are thoughts of peace and love toward us. So that much is true. And so since the hostilities that existed before, the hostilities between ourselves and God are literally resolved in Christ, we then, according to these words, are given free access to the grace of God. When the hostilities existed, it's almost like grace was within a, a, a walled fortress. And, and that was being guarded because we were enemies with God. But because of faith in Christ, it, it's like the great doors are open. And so we freely come in and access God's amazing and wonderful grace through Jesus Christ. It is freely given. And as it says here in Romans 5, then we now stand in that grace. And that grace points us forward with rejoicing in the hope, it says, of the glory of God. In the hope of the glory of God. And what I think that means is that we expect to share in the, the magnificent nature and character of God himself. Hope points us forward as we stand today in the grace of God that somehow we'll be made like God one day in the future. Hope points us towards that amazing possibility and indeed reality. And so it says not only that, but we also rejoice in, and I believe in means in the midst of our afflictions. Hope allows us to rejoice right now in the midst of the most difficult circumstances. Hope allows us to rejoice in a time that seems like we ought not to be able to rejoice. And again, it points us back to that phrase, hope is shaped on the anvil of God. In the difficult times, hope is being shaped by God himself. And why then would we want to rejoice amidst the red hot trials of life? It says in Romans 5, because we know that affliction, the trials of life, produce endurance. And endurance, it says, produces proven character. And ultimately, proven character produces that great quality of hope. That process sounds very similar to something else that we read, namely in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, when James says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. The idea is that that which God bends and shapes and forms on his anvil in our lives creates something of great lasting value. The difficult times are the times when God is making us into something better and of lasting value. You might have heard the saying that hard times either make us better or they make us bitter. 
Unfortunately, I've seen individuals who became bitter during those hard times. That is not an option for the child of God. Because we believe that since God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God, to those called according to His purpose, Romans 8, 28, bitterness is not the option. Better is the option because God is weaving the circumstances of our lives into making us better individual, hope-filled individuals. And so there is a quality of endurance that results as we go through the difficult times. I think I might have shared this story with you before. I guess I've been your pastor long enough. I've probably repeated a lot of stories. But it fits pretty well with this, uh, this thing about developing endurance in our lives. I go back to a year in high school when I ran track. And for practice, we ran the country square. The country square was, I believe, a half mile each leg of the square. And so I well remember that the coach would start us with the stopwatch. We would head off on the first leg. And just out of sight was a friend with a car. <laughs> We'd pile in the car. He had a stopwatch, too. Drive us nice and slow around those other legs. And he would stop just out of sight on the fourth leg, that last half mile. And he'd check that stopwatch. He'd say, okay, guys, time to get out. So we'd get out. We'd run up there to where the coach was who had his stopwatch. And he's kind of, yeah, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. We did that day in and day out for a while until the first track meet, the 880. Most of the team didn't even finish, much less have the good time that he thought we were going to run. Monday morning, coach ran with us. We began to develop endurance. It takes a degree of adversity to develop endurance, such as it is with the trials of life. The difficulties, the hard times, are when we develop the endurance to be able to run the race. As it says here in Romans 5, endurance ultimately develops proven character. Thinking about a horse by the name of Justify that won the Kentucky Derby this past year. That horse was heavily favored to win the race in the first place. And it is said of the jockey that rode him, he said, an amazing horse. He is so above average. He's got unbelievable talent and he's got a mind to go with it. That horse had proven character. That horse had developed endurance. Nothing like us guys that were supposed to be running track practice. That horse had proven character because that horse was a veteran of many races. And so according to what we read here in Romans 5, as we go through difficulties, as we develop endurance, over time, we also get proven character. We're a veteran in running the race. And so we are able to persevere. And out of all of that, we cultivate and develop hope in our lives. Proven character produces hope, it says. And this hope will not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. A hope that will not disappoint. The reminder that our hope will not disappoint us, it says here is the internal presence of God's Holy Spirit. It is the down payment, it is the assurance that what God has promised to us, He will definitely give to us. And so that Spirit resonates within us, indicating that God is going to do what He said He would do because He's already given us that down payment of what is to come. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it says, You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, given as a pledge of our inheritance. The day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, the day that you sealed it in the waters of baptism, you were also sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's called the Holy Spirit of promise. God says, now everything that you've read in Scripture about what I plan to give to you, now that really is yours. And here's the real evidence. I'm putting my spirit in your life as a down payment. It is a pledge of your inheritance. It is an assurance 
of the fulfillment of everything that will come to pass in the coming kingdom age. The convicting reality of hope tomorrow is Holy Spirit in our lives today. And again, as it says in Romans 5, this hope will not disappoint us. You know, hope that is wishful thinking, hope that has no substance, is very likely going to disappoint us. We sometimes throw that word hope around rather loosely. I can say I was hoping that I had the winning lottery ticket, which is pretty outrageous because I guess I've never actually bought one. I think you have to buy one in order to win. But I can say that. I was hoping that I would win the lottery. I was hoping I had the winning lottery ticket. Or I might say something like, I, I was hoping I would hear better news from the doctor. We can say those kinds of things because it's wishful thinking. Just an optimistic outlook that I'm just hoping for something good and something better out there. But that's hope without any real basis. The hope that we have is hope that will not disappoint. Amen? That's what God has promised to us is, is a hope that is beyond our imagination. A, a tremendous hope. It is a hope that will be truly realized exactly as God said that it would. But that does not mean it will be an easy way to the realization of that hope as we've been talking about. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 14 verse 12, it says that he went about strengthening the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith and by telling them it is necessary to pass through many troubles on our way into the kingdom of God. I think of those words and I think, wow, what kind of encouragement is that? He went around to young believers, to new Christians. He went around to them and he encouraged them to continue in the faith by giving what sounds like a rather discouraging phrase. Through many hardships, through much trouble, we must enter into the kingdom of God. That's a realistic statement. And I'm sure they were thankful that Paul was honest with them because that's the way that it is. The kingdom of God looks great. That's our hope. We anticipate immortality in the coming age. But it's not cakewalk time to get there. It's not an easy time to get to the kingdom of God. And so if we are to develop endurance, if we are to develop proven character, then we realistically face what it is that is to come. And I say that thinking, you know, some of those people sitting in churches that are hearing the prosperity gospel, and I, I have so much trouble with that on so many levels, but one of the real tragedies is people that hear that and believe that are not finding the strength and the perseverance to be prepared realistically to face what is to come. When you're being told that God wants to prosper you and make you very wealthy and, and take away your pain and whatever, that does not help you to develop endurance and proven character and that does not lead to real biblical hope. It's important to face the facts that God is shaping us on His anvil through adversity to make us a people for which hope shines very brightly. I was thinking about one of the great hope verses in Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. We often like to quote this. I've seen it on uh, placards and so forth. It's something that's uh, quoted quite a bit. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. It's a great hope verse, really is. A great promise that is made. But I think if we want to look at that verse in the context of some other verses around it, it helps us to really best appreciate it. Because it can easily sound like a promise of kind of a quick way out of our present challenges onto the great welfare, the great prosperity that God has for us, but I want to submit to you that in reality, this promise is a bright light at the end of a very long tunnel. Here's the back story, the backdrop of that verse. God's people were in captivity in ancient Babylon because they had been disobedient to God. It was God's punishment upon them. And in the midst of that captivity, there were false prophets that were rising up and saying that the captivity would last for only two years. Jeremiah 28 verse 3. 
That was their prophecy. Hey, it's bad, but it's only going to last for two years. Well, God was really speaking through Jeremiah the prophet. And what God had to say is, no, not two years, but 70 years, according to Jeremiah 29, verse 10. It's going to be a little bit longer than what you might be thinking. So therefore, it says in Jeremiah 29, verses 5 to 7, God says to them, He said, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for when it has prosperity, you will prosper. The message of God was, you're in the midst of adversity. You're in the midst of a long, trying, difficult time. So in the midst of that, work hard. Be diligent. Be responsible. Be praying for the city. Be praying for the land that you live in in exile. And as they are blessed through your prayers for them, you also will be blessed as well. And so all of that prefaces that great promise that I know the plans that I have for you. Plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and to give you a hope. We see that verse in a little bit different light when we know those circumstances. The promises of God, the hope of God might be further away than you think. The fulfillment of what God has promised may not be two years out. It might be 70 years out as it was for those people. And in essence, we may not see that fulfillment in our lifetime much as we wish we could. I would love to see the return of Christ in my lifetime. I have hoped for that for years. But I may not see that. You and I may not see that. What we hope for may be beyond our lifetime, but that does not diminish the fact that God will bring about what he has promised because we will not be disappointed in what God has for us. So the message of Jeremiah that comes down to us in the midst of our circumstances, especially difficult ones, as we wait for the fulfillment of hope, we live as responsible people of proven character. And so we do those things. We pray for the land that we live in. We pray for the city, so to speak. I thought about that. Does that mean we pray for an end to this government shutdown? And maybe we do because we think about those that are affected by that. Well, it's responsible that we do something like that. So that's a real practical takeaway from all that. But again, we live as people who endure. We live as people of proven character who have a testimony, who have a hope as we go through the times that we go through. Again, hope is shaped on the anvil of God. During the red-hot trials of life, God lovingly shapes and bends and molds us into a people of real hope. Having shared those things, I tell you that my testimony before you is that hope has taken on a fresh new meaning in the recent trials of my life. It's still difficult to talk about, but my dad's death has brought resurrection hope into a much greater focus and meaning than what it was before. Current circumstances in life, in my life, that are beyond control, I can say have become a crucible for forming greater hope. That's my testimony. But even as I share that, I know that my trials are not as great as the trials that many of you are going through. And I believe that going through the, those very difficult trials is raising up a great testimony of hope for those of you going through them. I believe the more difficult the trial, the more clearly hope is in focus. It's been said that biblical hope not only desires something good for the future, it expects it to happen. I submit that to you as being true. We do not just hope for something good in the future, we literally expect it because God said it is so, because God has proven it through his acts in the past. Our hope is not based on empty promises. Numbers 23, 19 says that God is not a man who lies or a son of man who changes his mind. 
Does he speak and not act? Or promise and not fulfill? It's a rhetorical question. We know the answer. God does what he says he will do. There is an ancient promise made to the people of Israel that is a precedent and is our confidence for hopeful expectation found in Joshua 21. I want you to think about what is said here as the basis for confidence in your hope. So the Lord gave Israel all the land that he had sworn to give their fathers. And they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side according to all he had sworn to their fathers. None of their enemies were able to stand against them for the Lord handed over all their enemies to them. None of the good promises of the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. Everything was fulfilled according to Joshua 1, 21, 43 to 45. I stand on those promises. That's my testimony. None of the good promises of God that he has made have failed. Everything is fulfilled. That which is yet future is as good as done today. Because our God is that trustworthy. What he says he will do, we have his word on it.